The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to the Cannabis News Hour. This is your host Michael McAuliffe and with me is my co-host Perry Haichu here in studio. Hey, wow, what a week this last week was. It was Definitely, it was lots of surprises. Ups and downs, uh, you know, as, as Dickens wrote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> um, it, it seems to be... Uh, you know, a, a great week for uh, for pot and um, uh, maybe, but, but depending well, on who we've got. You it know, seems like the all the polls concerning the marijuana industry over all eight states, or excuse, how many states were going? It, well, was, it was eight, nine. right? Nine. Nine states. Arizona is the only one that. Okay, so we got eight out of nine then. Yes. Okay, so what? It went legal, medically legal in Florida, in North Dakota, Arkansas, Arkansas, the first Bible Belt state to go medical, and and an updating of the law in Montana. Right. Well, they've had trouble with that. They like what the voters voted a, in about uh, an initiative, and mm -hmm. then the Supreme Court of Montana kind of put the clamps down on it, or something like that. Or the legislature came back and the amended it. The legislature came back and, and amended it severely, and so the voters this time had to go out and smack the legislators uh, with this initiative again to say this is the will of the people. Yeah. So we'll see how the how they respond uh, in their next session. And then, of course, California, Nevada, and uh, Massachusetts and Maine, Maine. also mm -hmm. went recreational, and all those polls seemed good. But uh, I don't know how they got so right with the cannabis and so wrong with the presidential. <laughs> I mean, are, are are is this the end of modern political polling as we know it after that upset? I you know. Um Modern political polling, not only that, it, and I do agree that it, it shows that polling is not the science we thought it was, but how campaigns are going to be run in the future. Compared to the projected costs of presidential campaigns this cycle and, and um, over the past, as it's been building the past few years, uh, Donald Trump spent next to nothing on his campaign. And I don't mean just personally, but they got the media to give them a couple of billion dollars worth of, of free airtime, and so they didn't have to spend. This campaign, although Trump has gone around, President-elect Trump, has gone around the country and um, done various appearances to, to quite large crowds, so much of his campaign was on TV. And oh, I, sure. And I do he think played that's them the like a, He played the media like a fiddle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I heard that he spent more money on hats and buttons yes. than on television commercials. Yes. <laughs> that's just... And it's played it's well to the rural crowd that uh, helped carry him over the top here. Absolutely, no you know. doubt. So it's, uh, it's interesting, though. When Ronald Reagan won the presidency in 1980, everybody thought, well, that's, that's kind of a... Uh, you know, a really strange thing, and you know, uh, an actor as president, how could that possibly be uh, a, a good thing? How could you believe this guy? And so here we are, 36 years later, with um, a TV reality star. People like to compare president. him to Reagan a lot, and I don't. Well, only yeah. in that they're they're both media personalities, and and the point of where I was going with that is that. Uh, a lot of the reading I've done or some of the reading that I've done suggests that the future political campaigns are going to be between more well-known people in the media. And I don't mean Kanye saying he's running right. in 2020 or Michael Moore saying that he's going to run in 2020. I'm, uh, but people, if you look back to the Kennedy-Nixon debate in 1960, a lot of people said what put Kennedy over the top besides all the dead bodies that voted in Chicago, or was the nixon Kennedy debate, uh, where Nixon just was sweating bullets and looked bad and looked nervous. Yeah, I saw time. a whole documentary and, on that. That was the first Kennedy televised was presidential debate, was it not? And, yes, it was. And, and Kennedy was, you know, young, handsome, 
cool calm, calm collected exactly yeah exactly that and and so uh there is um you know substantiation i think to to the theory that moving forward we're going to have to have people who are extremely media savvy and who are uh already with a public image uh, who will be running for these high offices we'll see how that goes maybe that will play out but the way i perceive it is that i think this is a uh a real slap in the face to the modern political establishment mm -hmm. as we see it. You know, Donald Trump wasn't the Republicans' first choice. He wasn't really their 16th choice, if you want to get right down to it. And he, you know, uh, the deck was so stacked against it. Like, the me you know, uh, the mainstream media really hated him. The Republicans hated him. The big banks hated him. You know, everyone, you know, Wall Street didn't donate to him. Right. You know, it was all of this uh, collected effort against him. And uh, he just turned all that upside down right on its head. And what that kind of shows me is that maybe we don't need major political parties to get candidates elected anymore and if we don't really if candidates realize that they don't need parties why are they beholden to the party line in order to curry those votes well, you know what I, so we might see uh I'm, I'm not saying that this is oh you know we're gonna go third party or whatever but i would love to see donald trump renounce his republican affiliation and go nonpartisan like he threatened to <laughs> just like senator patricia farley recently did here in nevada after and the election went say, down yeah go get me and you're stuck with pence <laughs> whatever well whatever it is you know what i mean i just think they really uh they treated him you know badly as he would put it over mm -hmm. the course of the campaign and i don't really see a reason for him to be kissing their ass and playing nice right now well, just except one, one of the people from his first season of apprentice omarosa uh, mm -hmm. uh, has said that his opponents are going to have to bow down before him now and that they're going to regret the days they said these things it you know that sounds like real well, banana republic uh, it is what it is you know i mean they're the one who picked you know Everyone treated him like a joke, underestimated him from day one, and that was his greatest strength is their underestimation of his capabilities. And uh, he's just a person, too, and he's a man. And when these people come out and are personally demonizing and attacking him, now that he's in an advantageous position, I would be a little bit afraid if I was uh, Rosie O'Donnell right now also. Uh, yeah, I, I guess you can't, uh, can't argue with that. Rosie uh, might, be, might be one of the people who are going on to that Moving the Canada website. Yeah, no doubt. So what else? You know, in talking about the president and whether he's a good choice or a bad choice, he is the choice of the Electoral College. Not the popular choice, but he'll be elected. And so, you know, what is that going to mean for people in this industry? Because uh, we have come uh, to a point where last Tuesday we doubled the number of states who have legal medical mar uh, legal marijuana uh, and uh, has more than doubled the number of people since California has the largest population of any state. I think there's 27 medical states now or 28 medical states 28 after all this? 28 medical states now. Uh, and, you know, if you include the number of, uh, the number of states who have CBD only laws, uh, that puts it well beyond the threshold of 35 states for a constitutional amendment. So if not that not that that's how pot is going to be re re no i don't think so but you know it just shows you have a super majority of the country that has um medical cannabis as completely legitimate and so anybody else uh they're going to come straggling along they're not going to yeah have but as we've uh, as we've seen time and again in our uh our lovely political system here in the united states the the voice of the people is very seldomly mm -hmm. uh, addressed directly and with this uh, marijuana issue it's, of course it's addressed directly during the campaign season and then promptly forgotten after election yeah day. well sure of course and i think there's a lot of uh, nerves being rattled in the cannabis industry right now because of a potential presidency or not a potential a upcoming uh, presidency by donald trump and the cabinet he's picking i guess has a lot of people and that, a lot of people that's, nervous that's part of the problem that we have here i've got i've got a couple of articles one uh, from marijuanapolitics.com that says president like Trump's anti-cannabis uh, entourage may restart federal war on marijuana. And the other one from uh, our friend Derek Stanley over at Hemp News uh, reporting what does Trump presidency mean for the marijuana industry. And uh, having, having read these articles a little earlier, um, we see that Trump himself is not an ideologue on this. Um, he he has come around uh, different uh, different positions. Uh, you know, he started his campaign off talking about drug dealers and rapists and this and that. Um, but you know, he's he's been around most every side of every issue. Unfortunately, uh, you know, he has said that he is a hundred percent in favor of medical marijuana. And I quote here: "Marijuana is such a big thing." 
I think that medical should happen, right? Don't we agree? I think so, he said, close quote. Um, I'm going to have to work on a Trump impression for the next few years. <laughs> uh, and, and then he said, uh, and then I really believe that we should leave it up to the states. So if he were to actually legalize uh, medical marijuana across the country, that would, that would be a great step forward. And it sounds like he's in favor of it. Okay, so he has talked about rescheduling down to schedule two look it's all it, once again it's just all talk though and the reason i say that is because once again he talks to all about oh i built this big business i built this great company you know that's all he talks about but it's like okay well if you're so 100 percent behind medical marijuana why haven't you come out and said all of the people who work for the trump casinos are no longer going to be drug tested for marijuana if you have a medical marijuana card he's made no such he's made no such announcements because in my opinion he probably has no real honest uh, motivation to change any of these things it, it's just all pandering you know will he really make a, a, a fuss of it not until uh, it, it depends on who he put I, it depends on who he puts in his cabinet but i haven't seen right. one person they've talked about not one who is friendly to the issue and the problem is that um uh, when uh, famously Trump had said uh, when he was trying to recruit John Kasich, look, I'll just have you two run, you run two things for me, the domestic policy and the foreign policy. You know, if he is, is going to do that to some degree with Pence, then we have every right to be scared because Mike Pence is a hardliner who has reinstituted uh, mandatory minimums for drug crimes in, um, uh, in Indiana. Uh, he is very socially conservative a oh, big yeah. fan of the DEA oh absolutely so, he's a big he's a big uh, hardline Republican if there ever was one and he's so, an evolution denier I mean he's a textbook Bible belt good old boy if we had a uh, President Trump um, say that he's going to defer those domestic issues to um, to Mike Pence while he's busy making America great again then uh, that could see a renewed federal effort here and you mentioned the cabinet uh, that too is a problem and, and the biggest problem uh, for anyone in the reform movement is the uh, US Attorney General and we've seen them left and right when we had uh, John Ashcroft in the early days of the Reagan administration he was a disaster for patients the uh, the Supreme Court the Rach decision uh, which addressed medical marijuana in 2005 was uh, prosecuted uh, by John Ashcroft and so um, the people, the the people who hold the office of attorney general, hold a great deal of sway over the entire Department of Justice and its subsidiary agencies, like the DEA, and the tone of the federal uh, prosecutors, the 93 pros federal prosecutors across the country, and so the people who are being talked about for this position right now are I, I can't believe that I'm even saying that Chris Christie is in the running for Attorney General of the United States oh, yeah. when he's enmeshed in this Bridgegate scandal and his subordinates just got convicted on all counts um, there there's talk uh, among the New Jersey Democrats in the legislature uh, that they're going to reopen this investigation and now they're going to be targeting Christie as a subject. And and whether that comes to fruition or not, he's got um, approval rates in New Jersey of 20%. That That's... Um, that's almost as good as Congress. Oh, my... Oh my. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think it's better No, than I know. Congress. I'm just giving you shit. But, but no, that, that's a good point, though. Um, but nonetheless, uh, here's a guy who's ethically and morally challenged. Okay, let's take the marijuana issue. He, ha he has been, in medical marijuana, is in his own state, he has been one of the biggest obstacles to their implementation of their program. As it oh, stands right now, New Jersey has six wholesale uh, grow facilities, uh, cultivation centers, uh, for the entire state. Mm -hmm. And that's just... Um, that's just not enough to serve a population the size of the state of New Jersey, and and so um, he has he has said earlier uh, this year when he was running to people who were legalizers, he said, "Well, look, if, smoke them if you got them, because when I come in January twentieth, two thousand seventeen, it's going to be federally illegal, and I'm going to enforce all those laws." And so. Uh, yeah, I I'm not uh, <laughs> not too excited about that, but thankfully, it seems like he's kind of getting. He's getting pushed to the back burner a little bit and like 
in the uh, in the Trump administration right now. Like he showed a lot of loyalty well, up front in the beginning, and you know there was a lot of talk like he was gunning for these jobs. But I think Giuliani will end up getting it. But you well, know, it he, could be he, Giuliani. And he's then, not the greatest either, though, wasn't he? The big broken windows. Uh, yes, broken he, windows. He started guy? the broken windows uh, in New York City in his in his first administration. You know, uh, stop and frisk and all that crap. He's a former federal prosecutor, so he's got the chops. Uh, you know, for for this job, and so the thing is. He has been so close to Trump, and I do think that President Trump is not going to be a policy wonk. I don't think he's going to be attentive to a lot of details because that's just not him. He's going to delegate everything to everybody, and yeah, so when he's he makes more of a somebody, big picture kind of guy, yeah, he's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so when he delegates uh, the Department of Justice to the Attorney General, he, I think he will give that Attorney General a lot of free reign. And so if you have Rudy Giuliani, um, you know, he's just. Uh, well, look, Trump's, oh, you know, I'm a friend of law enforcement. I'm a friend of law enforcement. I'm going to give the law enforcement the tools they need yes. to do their job. And it's like, dude, and I'm, I'm, all, well, it's like, I'm all for the cops being able to do their job, but is that code for rearming them with militant things and r allowing them to, you know, do no-knock war you know, and, uh, and you know, bringing back some of the things that, in my opinion, like Obama has kind of done a few good things on that on that level it's not about mm -hmm. chopping the legs out from under law enforcement or you know making it a level playing field or whatever it's just about having them enforce the laws in a way that doesn't threaten public safety more than uh, more than protect it I, I think it also means uh, choosing which laws to enforce unless you're going to run a regime like Ceausescu's Romania in the 1970s uh, and 80s uh, where they had one out of every five people on the secret police payroll. Unless Fuck. you're going to do something like that, you cannot possibly enforce all federal laws equally across the, the breadth of the nation. It, it we require much larger law enforcement resources than we have. I mean, you can track them now. You can track them by their cell phones. You can do their emails and you know, texts. But you can't physically arrest everybody for all crimes. No. And so it's where they're going to, to put their priorities. And, and we think there are plenty of other priorities besides Oh, certainly, uh, certainly. But look, I remember cameras. a few years ago, there were a ton of dispensaries in the San Diego area. Mm -hmm. And... There was whispers, oh, you know, the feds are going to come in and they're going to shut down the San Diego things. And people went, you know, we're, there's too many of us. They'll never get all of us. And all of a sudden, there were no more dispensaries in San Diego. But it wasn't the feds. It was the San Diego County yeah, but they, Commission. They were asking for the help, though. Yes. They went to them and requested the help. Yeah. Sure, of course, it started with San Diego County Commission, but they reached out to the government for this assistance, right. and they were more than happy to provide and the manpower necessary. And that's what happened in 2010 when they shut down all the dispensaries. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, the local authorities, Metro in specific, uh, couldn't realize they couldn't handle this on their own. So they called in the DEA, they called in federal resources to do these multi-jurisdictional task forces uh, and set that whole series of raids in motion. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're right in that the federal government can insinuate itself even into these local matters. Um, but Giuliani has, uh, getting back to him, he said, mm -hmm. I've checked with the FDA, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, yeah. uh, and he's, the FDA says marijuana has no additive medical benefit of any kind that the illegal trafficking of marijuana is so great that it makes much more sense to keep it illegal I will keep it illegal this fantastic is Rudy that's that's just wonderful right? uh, you know and so I think he is the odds-on front runner to become uh, Attorney General but there are uh, two other candidates uh, who are I guess a little more stealth candidates although they're, they're reasonably well known uh, and one of them is um, is Jeff Sessions and uh, the senator? The Sen senator Jeff Sessions. I haven't of, heard this. Of Alabama, I, I believe it was. And where did I have the the first page of this article go? Chris Christie. Oh, Jeff here Sessions. We go. Here we are. Sorry about that. Um, he's an ex-prosecutor from Alabama, hardline drug warrior for decades in the Senate, uh, building upon his professional prosecutor career. Um, he's been a senator since '96. He's he says I'm a big fan of the DEA, and that's a quote. Uh, before. Uh, when he was testing um, uh, or having uh, Michelle Leonhardt, the former DEA uh, mm -hmm. administrator, testifying, and he was asking her point blank if she would fight medical marijuana legalization. So here's a guy who is completely out of step with the country, but uh, nonetheless, he's um, 
he's a good possibility uh, of getting it. Uh, another another one that they're talking about is Pamela Jo Bondi, and she came to light in the presidential campaign because she's the attorney general of the state of Florida who was given a big campaign donation by Trump big $25,000, uh, and then declined to prosecute Trump University in the state of Florida. Uh, and she's being looked at uh, also as one of the uh, uh, the likely possibilities here. And, you know, the, as, I, as we were saying earlier, uh, I think that if President Trump is not a details guy and he delegates a lot of this. The guy we have to be really afraid of in this administration is Vice President-elect Mike Pence. Uh, here's a guy as, uh, as far-right governor of Indiana. Uh, his attitudes uh, in this area have been deplorable. Uh, he reinstated mandatory minimums for Indiana drug offenses uh, in questioning a proposed reduction in the severity of uh, Indiana marijuana laws. He stated, I think, and this is a quote, Mike Pence, uh, I think we need to focus on reducing crime, not reducing penalties. I think this legislation, as it moves forward, should still seek to continue to send us way strong message to the people of Indiana and particularly to those who would come into our state to deal drugs that we are tough and we are going to stay tough on narcotics in this state, end quote. Mm. Um, this this sounds like a scary guy to be. Uh, That's okay. Uh, they can talk tough. You know, we're talk we're tough. Also, we've been able to uh, to pass these laws in a long way, and we're not we're not giving up. We're not going anywhere. Absolutely. So true. absolutely. You know, true. they can yeah. they can push. We'll push back. And if it's going to go like that, then the house the house midterm race comes up in two years. Yep. Yep, and, and they'll start campaigning we're, soon. We're going to have to get uh, more people on the bandwagon with this, and I think a lot of Congress already is. But um, uh, you know, the administration sets the tone in a lot of ways. Sure, and, sure. And uh, you know, we're going to see uh, we're going to see where this leads us in the next four years, and it's going to be a wild ride. Hang on, and we'll be right back. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flowers waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And welcome back to the Cannabis News Hour. All right. We were just talking about the uh, the political ramifications of, uh, of legalization and the new administration coming in. And as we said in the last segment, uh, medical marijuana has now passed in, in four more states. Um, and so I wanted to just... Uh, look at a couple of the states that, that we have here just because uh, there are certain things of note and uh, in in the case of Arkansas uh, it becomes the first medical marijuana state in the Bible Belt and that is really showing that this is inevitable I think and when, once you have that kind of um, uh, that kind of wall starting to break down there there's no going back on well. this 
I've always felt that a lot of the more the Christian right should embrace medical marijuana. It's holistic medicine. It's natural. Mm -hmm. It's in the Bible. If you are a biblical person, if you mm -hmm. believe in that, you know, which a lot of Christians will tell you, you know, we believe it 100% word for word. There's no no uh no adulterating that so you know if you turn your book to page one genesis 112 it's right there in the first 129 and 130. yeah it, it's just one right. of those things they they just won't I, I i really believe we're doing god's work here to make a long story longer if if people are doing god's work making the sick well i mean i don't really understand you know what these people's uh problem is other than what they've just been force-fed you know what I mean? I think it's really a beautiful thing to see uh, some people in the Bible Belt starting to come out in support of this and uh, and hopefully break down these. I don't want to say break down these walls because there's you know we're all on the same thing. We're all on the same side here. We want to see sick people get well and yes. people live long, happy lives. I just think we have different ideas how people how we get to that goal, and uh, you know, they'll come around. And 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 you know, in in mentioning the Bible as you know one of the major religious texts in the world. Um, the thing is that it never specifically says that marijuana or cannabis in any way is bad. It doesn't. It doesn't even talk about it. The only uh, references to drunkenness and sloth and that sort of thing are related to wine. They never talked about pot that way. And there is um, there's serious uh, biblical study uh, that say that the cannabosum uh, is a, actually cannabis and that was a, the oil that was in the holy anointing. Oil. Yeah, I've heard that tossed around before mm -hmm. also. I mean, as many translations as there have been, we might never really know what well, it was, but from, I'd like to believe that that's the true. the Talmudic uh, scholars and, and uh, readings of the Torah, which is, is essentially the, oldest the, that we the can first get. book of the Bible yeah. uh, in, in many ways. And, and so... Uh, I, I agree with you. If people want to help heal the sick, uh, this is this is certainly a good way to do it. And if you uh, are following that philosophy you, that um, that God created everything in the universe, but everything He created was good, then if He created cannabis, surely it must be good. Absolutely. And, and so um, uh, the direction of insanity that we've gone uh, on in the I 20th like, century is. Well, I just don't like how people think that a political affiliation or the fact they go to church or something what should preclude them from supporting medical cannabis well <laughs> the good thing is in arkansas that they um they passed it with a vote of 53.2 to 46.8 so they okay. it's a six point margin yeah. uh which was how we expected to do here in nevada we did a little better than that and you know it, it's respectable this this is a bigger margin than um most presidential elections uh, and so what they're going to do is they're going to allow patients who have any of 17 qualifying conditions uh, including a catch-all uh, will get a written statement from the doctor and they'll be able to purchase medical marijuana from uh, dispensaries which have uh, been set up they're not going to be able to grow their own mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know it's it's still a good step forward now also uh, of note is uh, what I saw here is that one of the legalization states, Massachusetts, okay, uh, their their state senate leader says lawmakers shouldn't dilly dally looking at the new marijuana law, okay, mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, Senate President Stan Rosenberg, and I get this also from our friend Derek Stanley at Hemp News. Um, he's uh, he said that the initiative. Uh, for for marijuana recreational use on the boat that the Broders improved, will need improvements to address issues such as taxes on marijuana sales, driving while high, and edible pot, pot products. He told reporters he believed uh, most voters approved of legalization in principle, uh, but noted that the measure was drafted more than a year ago. I, I don't know why that's uh, so important. Um, before a report produced by their special Senate com uh, committee that visited Colorado. Um, it's still not going to change the issue in, right. any, in any major <laughs> way. He said, uh, now, you uh, had another uh, uh, spokesperson for the Yes on 4 campaign, uh, Jim uh, Borgazzani, say that 
I think this is too rushed. The legislature has a role to play, but I think they should respect the will of the voters, let regulators do their jobs, and then determine uh, what should be done, if anything. So you've got, on the one hand, you've got uh, a, a member of the state senate saying, oh yeah, we're th this thing that the voters just put in, it's fine, but we got to tweak here, we got to do this and do oh, that. Oh yeah, they even went on to say that the legislature has the right to revisit policy matters that were unaddressed or not addressed as well as they could. Yeah. They can do whatever they want, basically, is what that tells me, and they intend to. So yep. we'll see, we'll they're, see they're, how they're this goes. They're have to follow the will of the people to some degree, but um, how much, uh, we'll see. That's, just, that's politics as usual, I yeah. guess. Um, but I, I agree that uh, with the spokesperson for the Yes on 4 campaign that said they put this in, start with this, see how it plays out and then um, uh, and then you can tweak it if necessary um, but it, it looks to me like uh, the uh, Ro uh, Senate President Rosenberg uh, who's a Democrat by the way um, is, is looking to ensure that the taxes get on there and, well, taxes are what made this happen in all these states yeah so um, you know here here in Nevada uh, we we passed uh, question two by a, a, a nine-point margin, uh, 54 to 45, and that's quite respectable. And yeah. uh, as of January 1st, uh, 2017, uh, possession will be legal for adults over 21, possession of up to an ounce. And if you're if you're beyond the 25-mile um, limit from a dispensary, then uh, you can grow your own. Now, I've been thinking about this, and, and I'm going to be asking Tick Siegerblum, our, our good friend, the next time we see him, um, but if it becomes legal on January 1st, and the dispensaries that are not yet um, the medical dispensaries that are not yet allowed to sell to the recreational market uh, are not going to be put in place with those regulations by April at the earliest, maybe June. Right. I was just going to say we'll be lucky to get away with it in, in So the does that mean that every adult uh, in Nevada can start growing on January 1st because there are no facilities available to service them in the market? The way you just told it to me, yes, I would believe. Uh, I, I would believe I, so. I agree. I agree. Um, and now this is going to cause an issue when the dispensaries do open, uh, or excuse Are me, when, when it turns Are these people grandfathered in? That that is the sixty-four thousand dollars. That is the that is the question. And not only that, but this becomes an enforcement issue. It all it, it's like a like a series of steps. Like okay, there's a law in place that says you can't grow cannabis. So now you have to have Nevada juries convict if people won't plea out if something were to happen so if juries won't convict then DAs won't prosecute and Correct. if DAs won't prosecute then the police won't arrest mm -hmm. so it's this whole cycle and it has to start with the juries someone's gonna have to take it to trial and have well, them and that do happened it last year where we had a, a Las Vegas medical marijuana patient who had too many pounds and too many plants and they won house. I believe and he was yes he was exonerated and uh, and so the DA has not brought any more cases like this it's the uh, same reason I would then. believe because it's t it's costly, it's time consuming, and mm -hmm. it's agitating. No one likes to lose. Yep. So you know, um, I think this is going to that's the issue that's going to be created eventually. Is let's say everyone is not grandfathered in, and mm -hmm. this that and the because there will be no way to prove that these people were grandfathered in unless you force everyone that's growing to register. So if you can't do that, it's going to come to one of those cases, like I'm saying, eventually. Right. And we'll see, we'll see how this goes. I mean, hopefully it doesn't come to that and there can be a workaround. But uh, Well, it, another aspect of the law that's interesting and that Metro is all hair on fire about, um, which to me is a good thing, um, is that now cultivation for the first two go-rounds is, uh, or for the first three, is actually a misdemeanor with a $600 fine. And it, it's not till after the third conviction does it turn to a felony. And so um, what Metro is afraid of is now people who've been running these grow houses and were facing D felonies in the state of Nevada are now only going to be facing um, a slap on the wrist. Slap on the wrists, you know. So you'll have people. What, you think people are going like to grow that. 100 plants and could just could care less because they'll take the fine and take the risk. Well, that's what Metro is concerned about. You know, uh, you're going to have some happen? Of that. If it happened to a significant degree, if we had, you know. Um, 
10,000 patriots in the state of Nevada decided they wanted to start their own uh, their own houses and and you know grow 50 plants in a house metro could not possibly and even the federal government could not possibly come in and do enough to those people now i don't think you're going to have no. 10,000 people starting this, no. but but if if you only have a handful of people do it yeah they can get smacked down we've learned that in the past but the more people that get involved in something like that the harder it becomes for them to actually so what are we advocating it? a public service announcement to enlighten the masses Civil of their newly found rights uh, or, uh, i'm not I, i'm not suggesting I'm, that we take any action i'm just saying that um that if this were to happen uh, the scope of it would exceed uh the response capability and ultimately uh, that would force uh, the that would force government to either crack down tremendously or to rewrite the rules to reflect the will of the people Look, I think grown pot is just like anything else the people who are really good at it make it look really easy yes um, people who want to get involved in this they want to start quick they want to do it cheap and they want to grow really good stuff and that's not how it works you, well, it's a process two out of three there you know? yeah but you know you, you're finding genetics and all that stuff like right. it's a pain in the ass growing good cannabis and that's why most people just get frustrated yep. what metro doesn't realize is you're not going to have ten thousand people starting to grow. you'll have no. some people get into it people no. with green thumbs or people who are curious but most people who get into it are going to get frustrated they're going to walk away from it just like people who learn how to play guitar or something it sits in the corner and they'll have a corner full of grow equipment and they'll end up going down to the freaking weed store and buying their grass after a while mm -hmm. and that's you know that's what will end up happening but uh hopefully with the new democratic majority in both houses here in nevada mm -hmm. we can hopefully make some inroads that we were able the uh, we yes. can fix some opportunities that were missed last legislative session because of the red wave especially now that um that pat farley has switched and decided to go nonpartisan. yeah well you know this was bound to happen eventually the republicans in nevada have proven themselves to be pretty crappy republicans over the past couple of sessions especially you, you've been a lifelong republican oh absolutely yeah. yeah 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 i voted i've worked on numerous campaigns and i was a proud republican for a mm -hmm. lot of years and you know i voted for uh, I voted for voted for Donald, you know, and all that crap. Um, but really, it's just like you can only crap on your constituents so long mm -hmm. until they they turn on you. And yeah. we saw that here in the, the the Nevada legislature. A lot of the incumbents that voted for that tax increase are are, yeah. are, are out. And honestly, they they deserve what they got. Any and those uh, who weren't who weren't already uh, in the middle of their term. Some of the mm -hmm. state senators who voted, like Michael Roberson, who ran for Congress uh, and lost in the primary, he still had his Senate seat yeah. to go back. Well, to. sure, but yeah, I, he got lucky. He's highly un, unpopular, uh, and he'll probably get voted out in two years. It just is what it is. And so I I commend Senator Farley for being brave enough to take that step because, uh, like we were talking before the show, it's not an easy thing to just go ahead and resend your political affiliation after mm -hmm. a career and such. Mm -hmm. You you you're looked upon as a traitor by one half and the other half might not be so willing to take you in with open arms so conveniently but uh she's been a friend of our issue yep you know regardless of her political affiliation uh i would thank her for her service and uh, i i really wish her the best yeah i i do too and and you know she's going to be important in the legislature uh caucusing with the majority and it, a lot of this is dependent on the legislature because we were talking about timeline on this and the legislature um sits in february and um leaves in early june and so we don't know where uh, we're going to fit in that now. Typically, uh, pot issues have always been in the last couple of days of the session. It's they do everything now, else, and it, but here they want to be able to take in tax revenue. And there's a 15% excise tax uh, built in uh, to uh, recreational cannabis, and so they want to start getting that money in. And what I'm hearing from uh, people like Tick Sagerblom. Uh, is that we're looking to be done with this in early April and that they're going to initially allow the dispensaries who are already established uh, to have an 18-month window on this. And uh, because of that 18-month lock, I think we're going to see uh, a number of the dispensary licenses that have not yet been active come online. Oh, of course, they've been slow dragging as long yeah. as they can. And now that it's passed, you're going to see them raising money and going for it. And I think, you know, <laughs> It just is what it is. I'm not particularly happy with the way that's going to roll, but I just want to see the recreational get rolled out as soon as possible so that we can get that 18-month window as closed as soon as possible. I would like the 18-month window to start January 1st, but I don't think that's going to happen. No, it's, it's going to start um, you know, Whenever once the, 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 the statutes are yeah. written. Um, but it, 
from that point, whenever that is in April, uh, let's say, uh, that the legislature passes this bill, then the Department of uh, Taxation is going to have up to a year to come up with their rules and regulations and get this program running. So in, in the meantime, they're going to have in that year the, the supply available through medical marijuana dispensaries and, um, and, and your local friendly dealer is not going to go away, I'm sure. No, of course you not. Know? Uh, but, you know, and we're not suggesting that, that you should, uh, you should uh, support the illicit market, um, but we must acknowledge that they're there and, and they've certainly helped bring people to this point. Okay, we're going to take, a, we're going to take another quick break and come right back. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flowers, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. We are here with our special guest from the Yes on Two campaign, Joe Bresney. Are you with us, Joe? Hey, sure am. Thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us again, and uh, congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Great to be on. Yeah, we're just, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a, a surreal thing to be uh, watching the election results last Tuesday night when uh, we saw cannabis winning in eight out of nine states. And, you know, it, it was a nail biter for here, uh, for us here in Nevada because we didn't start releasing results for for quite a bit after the polls closed and and those first results were coming in from uh, some of the rurals and, and they, they looked scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first release showed us down uh, by quite a bit, but then when you took a look at the numbers of voters and where it was from, uh, the heart attack kind of went away. Yeah. Uh, but that first refresh on the Secretary of State's website stopped me in my tracks. 
Uh, but then when the early vote was released in Clark County, um, that moved it to a buffer of about 11 points uh, with half a million votes in. And so at that point, uh, we, we breathed a sigh of relief because uh, not only did that reverse the trend that we were seeing, but it also um, put us just about where our polling was showing us just about where we expected to be in Clark County uh, from the early vote. And then we thought, even if they're, you know, occasionally in Nevada, you'll see a, a conservative rally on Election Day, even after a depressed early vote uh, on the right. And uh, the, the Democrats got a little ahead on the early vote, and we knew they were pushing for an Election Day rally on the right. Uh, but I think we learned two things. I, I think the first thing was not every electioneer here has a huge uh, election day rally for the right. And the second thing is that if you, if you look at what happened here, uh, we actually gained points on election day. And if you look at what happened nationwide, uh, with it being kind of a red wave year, um, the one thing you can say definitively is marijuana is no longer a Democratic issue versus Republicans. This is something where in a red wave year, we won eight, of, eight out of nine races. Mm -hmm. And we're showing that there's significant support on the right now. So if anything, the demographic that defines support is, is age. If we have to pick any single thing, uh, we have a real drop off of support over age 65. Uh, but that, that year moves up every year. It's mm -hmm. not something where all of a sudden at age 65, they change their mind. It's generational. Uh, 10 years ago, it was anyone over 55. So uh, I think by 2020, uh, we're going to be looking at putting this thing away if we didn't just put it away on Tuesday. Well, we sure hope so. But the the problem uh, comes in that we were watching these results uh, coming from Nevada and and coming from these pro uh, cannabis states. But the presidential results were scary, and we were talking about this earlier in the show. Uh, we've got the cannabis may have won the election, uh, but. Uh, there could be scary people at the the attorney general's uh, slot and the, and in the vice presidency, uh, and so it it seems that for um, the cannabis movement, it never comes easy, you know. Because no, no. well, no doubt. Yeah. And I kind of had a, a question to follow up with that about. Uh, excuse me, a question to follow up on that to you, Joe. Um, so what's next for the conquering heroes of the campaign? Or do you guys go <laughs> back to back to Ohio? Or are you kind of going to refocus and not do a state by state thing now? Are you going to focus on on congressional action now? Like, you know, what happens? Where do you guys go from here? I feel like we're all out of easy wins. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are out of easy wins. Uh, and, I, I don't want to call uh, them easy wins. But you know, <laughs> uh, well, well, where I go from here, um, to, to be honest, is uh, I go back to my life. I mean, this is something where I was not a marijuana professional three years ago, and I don't know if that's really what I want to do. I, I did this because it was very personal to me, and this is where I live. And the other side kept saying, Joe, you're doing this to get rich, you're doing this to get rich. And I insisted that I wasn't, and the truth is I, I wasn't uh, doing this to get rich. I was doing this. Uh, because I wanted to get it done. Uh, so I, I've got a full-time job. I'm going back to that. My clients are happy to have me back full-time, uh, and I'm going to spend more time with my family. Now, as far as what the movement does from here, um, I've already talked to the team in Michigan that's putting together a 2018 campaign, and although my marijuana campaign days are done, they're behind me, uh, I'm going to coach their spokesman um, for Michigan because I think one of the things that made us really strong here um, and kind of gave me a handicap when I was arguing is any time that they would fly in someone from Project Sam uh, to argue on their behalf, I would say, oh, by the way, you know, my house is five miles from the studio. What time's your flight back to D.C.? Mm -hmm. And that really resonated because it was obvious that these guys were flying in, these heavy hitters, uh, to try and, and say a bunch of things about marijuana and the industry and Nevadans that just weren't true. So... Um, I think that that's going to be critical for Michigan as well, is to make sure that their spokesman is their spokeswoman is someone who has a, a local tie that is a local that lives there, that's been there, that knows the community, uh, and that knows the marijuana movement there. Uh, because I think that really gives us, um, I think that's the right way to do it. And I think it gives us a leg up over Project Sam, who just has these five guys that they parachuted at the last minute. 
Uh, they're very good. They're very good liars. But uh, but I think that you can beat them with well-trained locals. So I'm going to help out with that. Uh, the stuff on the federal level, um, I, I'll be honest with the with the Congress that we have. I don't expect any movement in the next two years on the federal level. But we do have Aaron Smith and the NCIA. And they've got a full-time lobbyist that monitors every piece of legislation, and they try for banking and tax reform every year. Um, but uh, I've heard from a couple of marijuana experts and a couple of, of friends I've got on the Hill, just you're not going to see a marijuana Congress. Even with the wins, um, the makeup of the House is locked in because of gerrymandering. And so I, I just don't think we'll see much progress for at least two more years federally. Uh, we've got NCIA doing that. I think what will be interesting, uh, Michigan is a midterm race that has a governor's race, so that will boost turnout a little bit, and it will be more possible for us to take marijuana to the ballot there. Uh, but overall, midterms aren't our game. I, I would expect to see two uh, states that we go for recreational as a minimum, but probably four is an absolute maximum. Because uh, the other thing that we learned this year, you know, we bid off about $45 million worth of campaigns nationally and we had about 25 million dollars uh, available to run those campaigns <laughs> and so uh, we the, the, the industry is still getting up and running with how much they can help fund advocacy and uh, the billionaire donors are now on the other side so uh, our billionaire donors have handed it over to the industry mm -hmm. and the industry is still getting up and running to where they can step up so I think you'll have a you know an okay year at 18, maybe two states, maybe four, and then in 2020 is where we're really going to look. If the federal ban hasn't fallen by then, even with a Republican Congress, if the writing isn't on the wall at that point, I think that's where you see an aggressive year. Is uh, you know the, the Democrats are going to be out for blood on the reelect for the presidential, um, and you will be in a presidential, so you have a natural bump of of young people voting, which trends our way and the top line the, the older folks who do not like us um, and won't vote for us under any circumstances they'll be four years older and a lot of them um, either be gone. a lot of them will have passed yeah they'll be yeah. gone so um, so it's something where I think 2020 is going to be the, the next big push election year where you may see five or six states go at once although that's not to take away from the fact that um, that this election day in 2016 was, I think, the watershed day for the movement. It was the, you know, the biggest historical wins that we've had in this country. And anything that happens in 2020 essentially is building on what we what we accomplished this year and yeah. um, what we've mm -hmm. done across the country, especially as you point out, in a red wave year, mm -hmm. is a um, is astounding and and it shows that uh, even though some of us may question it in the light of this presidential election in some ways Americans still do have some common sense you know at least yeah. when it comes to their weed so yeah, uh, yeah. so well I hope that, that it, it, what I've been hearing because I I have some contacts on the right side of the aisle mm -hmm. and, and some folks that are going to be working with this new administration and what I've been hearing, you guys actually alluded to at the beginning of the conversation, because you didn't say Donald Trump dislikes marijuana or President-elect Trump, God, it's weird to say, but yeah, or no. President-elect Trump is going to come after us. What you said was, you mentioned Chris Christie, Rudy Giuliani doesn't like marijuana. Um, you mentioned those people who could be a real issue for us. Um, but that's the feedback I'm hearing is that um, Donald Trump's a populist. He wants to leave this up to the states. If anything, he is known for taking a look at problems that need a solution, that the solution is being prevented because that's how it's always been or that's what we're, the step we're afraid to take. And he's the one to come in like a bull in a china shop and say, stop kidding yourselves, let's just do this. From that perspective, this could be a very pro-marijuana legislation if he wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what? This is this is stupid. We should fix this. And we've got eight states showing us the way to do it. Let's remove the federal ban. Let's remove the banking ban. Let's remove the tax penalties and, and let these people do business. That's very possible. The problem with, with Donald Trump that a lot of people like me said the whole time was, you don't know what he's going to do. You know, he could 
have four breakfasts in a row with Rudy Giuliani and decide to embrace the gateway theory, mm -hmm. and then we're in for a really bumpy ride for four years or eight years. So, uh, so that's the problem is I'm hearing, although Mr. Trump may be uh, leaning our way He's and easily may, may agree with us, mm -hmm. it's the folks he's surrounding himself with that have always been your, your reefer madness guys. Crazy, crazy stuff. Well, the idea that um, that Donald Trump could be the pot president to me sounds oh like God. a stoner fantasy. So <laughs> I don't know about it. I don't know about that, Joe. We'll we'll figure yeah. that one out. But anyway, hey, I want to thank you for taking the time to call us today. I want to thank you for your work on Question Two. There are a lot of people in this state who are breathing a sigh of relief uh, over the. Um, removed uh, or greatly reduced threat of, uh, of police interference in their lives and yep. uh, it, it's an important thing and it, it's nice that uh, that we had fellow Nevadans working on this uh, uh, this time uh, to carry us over the line so uh, thanks again really Joe proud of how we got this yep. time. yeah thank you I appreciate it Absolutely. all right we'll talk to you soon bye now all right take all right, and so uh, before we go, we just wanted to uh, cover uh, one last uh, bit of information. <clears throat> well, uh, Weekend is having our third annual Thanksgiving potluck here at, uh, let's see, th this particular event will be Saturday, November 26th. That's next Saturday from 1 to 6 p.m. at the Cannabis Chapel. That's at 827 South Las Vegas Boulevard, Suite A2. And that's right in downtown Las Vegas. So uh, if you have a chance, come on down, bring your favorite dish, meet some good like-minded people the th uh, Saturday after Thanksgiving, and it's always a good time. <laughs> yeah, you know this could this could be like uh, the first American Thanksgiving, where you have um, uh, the Native Americans bringing some of their bounty to to save the starving pilgrims. So that so we we'll have a good time getting together there, uh, helping each other uh, understand what's going to be happening in the next few years with this. And you know we may even have uh, we may even have a few police wander in that we have to pass some enlightenment to. Well, I guess that you doesn't never, happen until next year. Right, yeah, you never know. And uh, <laughs> if you want to tune into the show, remember to tune in at www.dbtv.com. And if you want to call in with questions, the phone number is 702-685-8380. And feel free to call us and talk to us. All right, and with that, we're going to say farewell and adieu again for another week. We're going to bring you the latest news that we have in the cannabis movement uh, in Nevada and across the world next week. And we look forward to your joining us. Bye now.